Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Everyday Trader. I almost called it a daily market update. <laughs> I'm used to doing daily market updates. Everyday Trader. The. Uh, joined here by Eric Hale. The Everyday Trader. The Everyday Trader. Like like uh, the Ohio State University. <laughs> the Ohio State University. That's yeah. Right. Yeah, that's. You have a sign that My Ooh. son went to Ohio State. You know yeah. that. You could, you're a Buckeye, right? Or at least your son's a Buckeye. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Well, really. I'll do respect. We, I don't, I, the team's fine. <laughs> yeah. We have had um, some significant volatility in the markets since we last recorded, since we last talked last week. And um, obviously, everyone who, uh, a week ago, had no idea that the existence of a carry trade existed, are now experts on what specifically the yen carry trade was and the potential risks that that poses to financial markets, as it's definitely driven some volatility. In fact, we were talking about this before we started recording. We hit levels on the, on the VIX that we've only seen twice um in in the last well in, in ever right we in we, we've seen it in the the great financial crisis of yep. 2008 and we saw it in mm -hmm. covid um in, in the panic that we thought the the world was shutting down uh there for a little while other than that i mean we we didn't even see this level of vix in the internet bubble uh when the internet bubble was bursting we didn't see it when chinese devalued their currency back in 2015 uh, in the, even the, what's, what's referred to as Volmageddon that destroyed a bunch of, um, trading firms back in the day that were selling options as their primary strategy. Uh, this was a very big spike in volatility, essentially over the weekend. Um, and let, let me pause and ask you, um, you and I have been friends for a long time. I mean, decades, and we've lived through some of those events together, um, thinking about the global financial crisis and when that was happening. And then also, you know, the the COVID, you mentioned those two points for the VIX. Um, does it, I mean, do, do you remember how you felt? Let me, let me pull up a chart real quick of the VIX here and share this on the screen so that everybody has this into perspective. So here we are back in 2008, where, um, you know, we that just the VIX crack went up to was it 92 I think was the peak and then here we are again in um in 2020 with the COVID shutting down the world and and now here we are uh peaking at you know, almost 66 on the VIX so the VIX is a fear index it's so-called fear index what it measures explicitly is the price of options on the SPX, which is a cash settled index on the S&P 500 that expire 30 days from today. So it looks out 30 days, it looks at the expiration series before and after, does a weighted average and calculates what is the implied volatility of that index. So it ostensibly when people are fearful, they'll pay more money for insurance. So insurance gets expensive. Um, sometimes before the event happens, sometimes it's after the VIX, tends to move um, in response to the S&P 500 pulling back. And we had a massive pullback that happened over the weekend. This, this was Friday. And then Monday was just, you know, we were, we were heading towards uh, some people running around uh, like chicken little uh, I felt, but, but back to my question, Greg, does this, I mean, how does it feel to you right now with this level of fear? Does it, is it commensurate? You know, to be quite honest, no, it's not. It, at least it's not yet. Uh, and maybe it's because it was just a few days ago. And maybe we haven't seen the fallout of everything yet. But I also don't see the same level of systemic risk that were in both of those two situations where we saw it before. I mean, 2008, we had systemic risk. We had some of the biggest Wall Street firms ever going bankrupt. We had Bear Stearns. We had uh, Lehman Brothers uh, getting acquired. We had Goldman Sachs. If if Warren Buffett doesn't step in and bail out Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs is gone today, just like Lehman and, 
and Bear Stearns. We had the financial system was in ruin in 2008. And it was bad. There was a lot of talk of the entire market crumbling. Obviously, 2020 was more of a, um, it wasn't necessarily a financial fear as much as it was a social fear, right? It was what's going to happen with this pandemic. We have we have risks. We have what's it going to do to small businesses? What's it going to do to commerce and trade? And th those were all real tangible fears that were quickly overcome. I shouldn't say quickly. 2008 was not quick, but they were overcome with the bazooka of money that came from the Federal Reserve. And it came in some cases relatively quickly. This one is different in many aspects in that it was just as it was a plumbing issue, basically. It was a trade that existed. Now, albeit a really big trade, that a lot of people have used for a long time, um, arguably for almost 20 years, because Japanese rates have been so low for so long that this Japanese carry trade has been going on for a long, long time, that when, Je when Japan started raising their rates a couple of weeks ago, it really broke this trade where all of a sudden it was a margin call. And maybe that's the difference is this is, this is a margin call. Now, the unknown effects that I think of still, why I don't know if I say, you know, I don't know if I'm over it yet, is it's still close enough that I haven't, I'm not 100% certain that it hasn't broken a few firms. I'm thinking specifically, and one piece of anecdotal data uh, over this last week, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but zero day options trading volume has absolutely plummeted this week. <laughs> um, and I wonder how many firms that are out there that had built strategies around selling iron condors on zero day options with huge, huge risk, high, high 90 some percent probability. And those little tiny probabilities blew their accounts up. And I, I don't know yet this week. I, we're still close enough, I think, to margin calls and companies liquidating that maybe we recovered quick enough and the rally we had the last few days is, was quick enough for them to meet their margin calls. But I, I don't know yet. But but I will still say I don't have that same level of fear. How about you? Yeah, that was, that was my question. And but I, I'm, you know, I was showing a chart from back in that time frame. So here's you know, this is. The current looking back 20 years of the VIX, but this this is the time frame from 2005 through 2011, just to sort of capture everything and where we were. Um, following the you know 2008, we started getting these moves down, and this is where the VIX was spiking. And you know we got a math. This is each one of these bars, by the way, is a month. So the it spiked down, and then we or I'm sorry, these are a week. So the very next week was right back up and almost, you know, not quite recovered. Everybody was all clear. And, you know, this is in hindsight, everybody knows what happened was collateralized debt obligations, these CDO products, which, you know, nobody knew what they were at the time. And, you know, I remember people saying, oh, come on now, giving people mortgages, that's not going to cause this to crash. How do you, you know, that's the, that's the most stable thing in the world is giving people mortgages but we we sort of changed the underlying framework and it's very well understood go watch the big short to get a picture on how this how things changed and it's this you know i'm pointing the finger at financial engineering and and it's it's been known to cause these crashes before i, I think of um um marks howard marks uh, one of his great books, which was published right before the COVID crash. He says, I don't know what the next crisis is going to be, but I know what's going to cause it. And it, and it's going to be something to do with debt. And he was wrong because it, we did have this, uh, this global financial uh, uh, pandemic or global pandemic that affected the financial market. So he was wrong in that case, but his point is still just as valid that, you know, we are going to have crises in the future that are due to, you know, financial engineering and what's happened. Let's, let's review what the carry trade is real quick. And I'm going to take something that the Kobesi letter published this week 
uh, just as a graphic to show the the carry trade is is a very simple concept. So you go borrow uh, ten million dollars uh, from ten million yen. Ten million yen. I'm sorry, ten million yen from Japan, and you're earn. You, you got to pay a 04 percent interest rate. That's the interest rates in Japan are so low. So after a year, you're going to have to pay ten million forty thousand yen. So you convert that 10 million yen to US dollars, it works out to be $83,000 and you put it in a money market fund and you make 5%. And at the end of the year, you convert it back to yen and, and you make 460,000 yen with a, it's, it's not a bad return on somebody with $83,000. Uh, it's, it's just, but what the problem was that people just didn't put it, put it in money market funds. People put it in, what did they put their money in, Greg? You, you said well, they put it. They put it in Bitcoin. They put it in Nvidia. They put it in Apple. Right. They put it into assets, into risk assets. It was not just. You're right. It wasn't just in T bills. It, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with that. And the people who trade, you know, institutions are constantly trading on margin, and it it's a wise decision to to go to the bank and they have the opportunity to trade internationally to go to the bank that has the lowest interest rate. So what they did was there's nothing nefarious or or bad, but what happened was um, the Japan raised their rate. So they raised their rate quarter basis point and that sent shock waves or butterfly wings that that turned into shock waves and hurricane on the other side of the planet because when the margin goes up, some people have to provide more more capital to cover the risk that they've already taken. And if you already find yourself with that capital is not sitting in a bank, it's someplace else. So what do you do? You got to go sell something. And this is what happened is people said, OK, we get a margin call. I'm going to start selling assets. And we saw that happen. And then another quote that I heard this week was algos tracing algos. So you got short-term algos that are saying, hey, something's going on. People are selling. Let's let's go with it. Let's let's push this momentum. And and that's what happened um, there. The other point I wanted to make, I'll let you make it. What's how does this how does the carry trade break? There's two ways to break the carry trade. What's the other way? Well, there's two ways. One of them is what Japan did in that and started to break it and that they were raising rates. The other way to break it is for us to lower rates, for the Fed to come out and cut rates. And that's why, you know, it was really ironic that you heard, you know, on Tuesday or Monday, I don't remember, Monday was the really bad day, right? Um, on Monday, there was calls for the Fed to step in and do an emergency mid meeting rate cut of upwards of 75 basis points. And it's like, what? you do realize that would make the problem worse. Yes, that's literally the worst thing that you could do in this situation. It It's, uh, hey, you're, having, tr here, you're to, having trouble dr trouble swimming. Let me throw you a brick. Yeah, I was, I'll give kudos to Guy Adami. You know, Guy's a friend of mine, has been for years. You and I have done some events where we've been on the same stage with Guy. Um, and Guy on TV basically said the same thing. He kind of said, it's like, hey, if the, if the Fed actually had a set, they would uh, actually raise rates at this point. Um, and then it was very quickly pointed out. They do, they have a set of mandates. They have the dual mandates that that they uh, are trying to maintain. But yeah, I but guess the other way to break it is a unstable currency as well. Um, which kind of goes hand in hand. I mean, that's one of the things that happens when the Fed is, excuse me, I say when the Bank of Japan started raising rates, that's what happens. The yen started skyrocketing. You know, was, the yen dollar trade was just going through the roof. And um, I guess the question I have, Eric, at this point, now that we've talked about the basics of what the carry trade is and what it broke, is is it done? I mean, this trade's been going on for 20 some years. I mean, people, there are institutions that have probably built the backbone of their cash flow system that they make money on this yen carry trade. How much money is this going to cost big investment houses like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and institutional hedge funds that, you know, is there a, is there a uh, Bernie Madoff out there right now that just hasn't surfaced yet because it was just this week? I don't know. Is it over? 
Well, you know, I, I don't have the ability to answer the question because, you know, quite honestly, I, I was not an expert in the carry trade. I'm still not. Uh, I mean, I had heard of it. You and I follow Michael Gayed, and he has been on this for a year, the, the carry trade. And I mean, I just remember him like uh, screaming last week that I will be proven. He's very confident of himself, and I'm looking forward to meeting him at, Co at Camp Kotak. But it, and on his Twitter feed, he's sc basically screaming that the carry trade is going to break and I will be proven right. And this was just last week. So his account has exploded. Now he would probably have a better idea of how big this is. Uh, and there tends to be knock on effects that other things get affected. So how big is the carry trade? I just, this is just something that I saw from TS Lombard um, just this week. They're trying to take an idea of how big is this carry trade. And it's, they're, they're guessing about a trillion dollars using some publicly available data to try and guess what's out there. And I, I mean, I don't know that we've seen that come out. Now, JP Morgan has said that it's over, that, you know, the worst is over. And I am, I'm not gonna, I'm, I don't know that I can go into that camp. I, I need to go back to this VIX chart and just say all the VIX tends to take the elevator up and the stairs down. That's just the nature of the wave volatility, and it makes sense. But we have seen the VIX absolutely plump, plummet right back down almost to where it was. I mean, just a few points away from where it was last week. Um, do you think this is going to be a solitary spike on the VIX? And I, I guess, I, what, did, what are the reasons for the route? So this carry trade is one of the concerns. That's that's just we're putting it on the carry trade, but how much of it was due to the carry trade? I don't know that we totally know, and we don't know if it's over. But there are other things that are happening in the market too. And I'll defend Jeremy Siegel, who was out calling for rate cuts. He has been utterly consistent on that since June. He's been screaming for rate cuts, and of course on Friday, everybody you know he's he's a he's a bombastic speaker, and he gets a lot of attention and gets people talking. So great, he's going to be on CNBC, and he loves it, and he gets fired up. And calling for a 75 basis point emergency cut, maybe I, I, I'm very thankful that the Fed tends to be uh, a little bit more uh, reserved in making their decisions and tries not to be so market reaction. I, I'm glad that that didn't happen, but he's been concerned about overall that inflation is, you know, his point is that we gave dot plots on where we thought um, the economy would be, you know, in June, and we're there. So, you know, in, inflation is dropping, and uh, we're, we're probably we don't want to overshoot. So, so he's been consistent. So he's got a point that, you know, is the recession risk increasing? And of course, this week we see Goldman Sachs and um, some of the other big institutions announcing that the probability of an of a recession in the next twelve months is is higher. It's gone up. And there's no question a recession is coming. We, we've got a recession coming. The question is when. Um, and then, so- When and, and, and how deep as well? You know, how, mm -hmm. is this going to be a shallow recession? Are we going to be able to muddle our way through it for maybe a few quarters and then back to growth? Or is this going to be a deeper recession? Something more along the lines of uh, what you were pointing to that um, Howard Marks was saying that, you know, the next- issue that's going to come up is debt. Is that the next one to come up? I don't know. Well, there, I am concerned about the knock-on effects of what happened. There's an inch, there's an instrument that people have, and I've traded it. I've used box to put some money. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting strategy where you're basically scraping the risk-free interest rate. It's, it's got a lot of attention, a lot of volume, but if you, you look at this chart here, and this is just one of the ones that I watch because it's on my watch list. This look what happened this week. Um, we've got this sort of reset that happened, and this thing that is an uber stable. Um, there is real trading and real volume. I was I was looking at the intraday pricing on this, and so the these financial engineering products and Wes Gray creates this product, and I think he's great. I I love um, everything that Alpha Architect is doing, and Wes Gray is awesome. Uh, here and he's got a lot of unique products, but <laughs> this is one that really concerns me. And when it was happening during the day, it was a big old. I mean, I was. This is considered, you know, a safe place to put your money because it just generates. I mean, let me go back a year chart. This is 
there's a lot of people who are putting money into this thing and some weird stuff happened. And fortunately it looks like we're back on track, but I'm sure some people are looking at that saying uh, it's maybe it's not as safe as we think it is. And, and these other volatility products, like you mentioned Balmageddon, when we saw these VIX derivative products explode and go away and things go to zero overnight, these, some of these really complex ETFs, um, you know, it's, it's all in the, it's all in the, uh, the disclosures. If you read the prospectus, these things can go to zero and they can shut down overnight. And guess what? The people who make them, they don't lose any money. <laughs> They keep getting paid because they get paid to manage the fund and they're making a percentage off of it. And I'm sure they're disappointed, but it's the people who are trading these products that end up feeling it. So I'm fearful that this thing's not over. I don't, you know, I, I really hope that it is. And it sure feels like the market's all calm again, but we've got volatility that's happening right now. It's just volatility, the upside volatility, to the downside, it gets noticed, but volatility to the upside, we tend to say, oh, that's just the market being bullish, but it's volatility still. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, it's kind of our human nature. We want to let, uh, we want our stocks to go up in value. So we don't scream and yell when they're screaming higher um, and say that it's just normal. But yeah, you're right. The, the, the volume down, the, the speed down that we had this, this week, and then the the rapid recovery we've had really in the last two or three trading days back to the upside is still volatility. Yeah. Um, we were almost yeah. back to where we were on the week. And if you look at a weekly bar, this is be like, well, this is one of the most impactful weeks that we've had in years. And this is this there, there could be, you know, this is a notable asterisk. And if we look at weekly bars on the chart, it's a nothing day. It's a nothing burger. <laughs> so it's, well, and I mean, so the candle wick is going to look really nasty, but it's it's basically going to be a doji. Yeah. The way it's sh setting out right now. If you look at it on a camel. So a doji is where it opens and closes at the same price. So, well, I guess I'm wrong. So, no, not a doji. I guess we did open down. Low. Well, because we opened when you take a big week. gap down. But if so you, yeah. Depends on which day we take is a week. Um, but there is a, a doji in there if you start, I think, um, instead of Friday to Friday, do Monday to Friday or Monday to Monday. Um, it'll it'll look like a doji. Yeah, and that's uh, again. I don't I don't want to. I don't want to say that that everything's fixed. I'm glad that it has bounced back up. I I I'd, I'd be pretty worried if we had continued because that means something is has broken. I'm hopeful that there's still enough enough liquidity um, that still wants a yield and wants a return that that we've that we have found a bottom, but I, I don't know. I agree with you. I still have an underlying sense of, I'm not sure. And for that reason, I'm collared, you know, to go back. And what I mean by that, for those of you who haven't followed us for a long time, all my positions are in some form of a collar trade right now. Um, the collar trade to me is the way to survive these types of chaotic markets. And I don't get caught. I try to not let my emotions get caught up in the, Oh, I wish I would have bought, you know, the dip. I wish I would have jumped in and bought NVIDIA at 92. Um, because I bought NVIDIA at 128 just a couple of weeks ago. And I wrote it down to 92 um, and didn't panic out of it. Didn't fear that, oh, no, I've dropped, you know, my, my investment has dropped 30% in value, you know, peak to trough in just a couple of weeks because I had a collar trade on and I'm down a little bit in my NVIDIA position right now. It's because I wanted to be a little more bullish than I should have been when it first rolled over a couple weeks ago. Um, but it's the collar trade that has made it so that I'm like, eh, yeah, we had a really volatile week. Now I also didn't rush to close my puts because I don't know that we're done. I don't know that we're through it yet. So I'll just stay in this form of, hedge until we get calmer waters which hopefully are a couple weeks from now you and i like to talk on this um at this show about um liquidity and you, we were bopping through some of the numbers there there's still I, I i think plenty of liquidity and reason to be bullish in this market i, I do think we're going to see things plow higher but but yeah certainly you're right using 
uh, options as a as a way to hedge risk, which is why they were originally created. Not as a you can use them as a speculative instrument, but uh, kind of boring to do collar trades. But certainly, when you've got positions that you've been in for a while and you want to be able to ensure that you don't lose money it's completely possible to to lock in your profit and i've got several trades that are basically in holding patterns till we figure things out um they're, they're doing okay so using the collar trade um, allows me to you know be objective here we tend to be uh biased we have all we all all have human biases in our behavior well we tend to be biased to um see what we need to have happen for our portfolio to make money. So if, if you're long stocks, you, you seek bullish data. And if you're bearish, you seek, uh, if you're long stocks, you seek bullish data. If you're, if you're poor, uh, position short, you tend to look for, for bearish signals. Uh, and that's, I know that that happens. So my, my goal is to try and be like the Zen master and just take whatever is in and, and be able to, you know, you can even set up a collar trade where it makes money. If I mean, you could go do a trade right now, buy a stock, buy a, uh, like a medium term put, like 45 day at the money put, sell an out of the money call that's out about three, four months. That trade will make money as long as the stock goes up or down. You don't need the stock. As long as it moves, you can literally make money on that trade. Owning the stock, literally make money with the stock going down. Or make money with a stock going up. But that particular trade, you don't want the stock to be too stagnant. And that's just one version of the collar trade. But being able to have that strategy in your back pocket, you say, you know what? I don't know which way the market's going, but I know it's going to go. And and being able to uh, lock yourself in um, and, and be able to sleep at night and knowing that you've got, you know, uh, the ability. To, <laughs> I don't know if people how are doing these these credit spreads on, on, um, on zero day options, they <laughs> I would be a nervous wreck. I couldn't. Oh, I know. That's an absolute strategy. Well, like I always said, when we started earlier, I think we may still have a few of those firms that may go belly up or parts of their funds that were trading. Cause I know there was a lot of activity around that, um, that there were companies whose entire basis, their, their strategies were, zero day iron condors that you're not supposed to have more than about a half a percent movement on a daily basis. And even on the, some of the bullish days this week, we've had just these huge intraday swings, both to the downside and then back again to the upside. You know, the general idea around an iron condor is you're not supposed to be able to lose money on both legs, but man, if you traded it wrong a few dot times this week and try to just leg out of iron condors, yeah. you could end up losing max on both sides of your trade. Yes. If you were, if you were just trying to leg yeah. in and out of those yeah. types of trades. One side gets violated. So you close it for a loss and then it goes the other side. And then way. the other side gets violated. And the other side gets violated. Yeah. I don't like legging out of iron condors. I usually close them. And I don't like having iron condors that, you know, expire within a day or two. I'm, I'm usually doing them out of you know, a few, three, four weeks out and then closing them usually the week of expiration it's uh, a little more boring but but that's uh that's okay boring's okay i mean if you make a nice steady return i'm not i think people need to realize that there's a lot of folks that really don't care about their money or, or i shouldn't say that maybe they care about their money but you know there's people who go to vegas and i've i've, I've seen i remember you and i one time i don't know if you, there was this old guy he got a five thousand dollar marker so they came out with a big rack of chips and a whole bunch of black chips and he's playing craps and you know, 5,000 bucks. He just put down on the table and just spread out like it was nothing. Um, there's people who do that in the casino. I mean, the, did I say casino? I meant stock market. <laughs> I was, that was an intentional slip, but there, you know, there's folks out there and you're seeing these people on who knows where they are. Uh, you know, that's, everybody's a little bit different. And just because somebody else is in a trade, that doesn't mean you all need to be into it. I, I, this zero day option, you and I were talking before we get started, one of the uh, comments was made earlier that it's a lot of beginners who trade. And I disagree. There are a lot of experts who are trading zero day options. There's, there's no question. Um, and those are the people who, by the way, have the ability to move markets and they're trading, you know, sizes uh, of trades that are probably as big as your entire portfolio. 
And so if you're a, a small fish in a big pond, you, you might be bait. And it's just, uh, but I, I know people all the time. I run it every week. I run into people saying, oh, I'm doing zero day options. And I've also, on the other hand, had opportunity to talk to clients. And one one client in particular, I remember, was in tears. They, the guy was looking at, you know, it's a small trade that would have made like a like a thousand dollars or twelve hundred dollars and he had got himself into a situation where if things didn't go right he was going to lose twenty seven thousand bucks or risk more with the hope that it got bigger and i mean twenty seven thousand dollars is you know that's a lot of money to some people that's you know probably more than you save in a year in your ira your 401k and you know just is it worth it to take that sort of risk and the answer that it doesn't it hasn't happened to me yet. Like I always say, there's five satisfied players in the Russian roulette game. <laughs> yeah. They're five geniuses. And and then there's only one idiot. Uh, you know, it's, that number is going to come up and just, you just need to look at weeks like today to ask, is it, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Maybe some people love the thrill and they're doing it for other reasons than you and I. So don't feel like you need to be trading these things that other people are trading. Uh, I just, um, uh, I, I wouldn't do it. And I, I, didn't, I would try to counsel friends and family to, to avoid that sort of stuff too. Okay. Well, have fun in uh, Maine. I will miss fishing with you next yeah, week. Going to be a good week. We'll have to uh, get together after you get back and give everybody an update on the, the uh, knowledge you have gleaned from Camp Co Talk. It is gearing up to be a very exciting week with a lot of great content. I mean, it's all day. As you know, you get up in the morning, you, you have breakfast and you talk about the markets and then you get on a boat, fishing boat and you're with some other interesting person, maybe a chief economist or a former Fed member or somebody like Jim Bianco or Danielle DiMartino Booth. And yeah. um, and then then you have lunch and you talk about other stuff and then you have go fishing again and then you have a break and then you have dinner and then it goes until yeah all day all day and all night <laughs> and then I'll need a vacation when I get back <laughs> there you go all right my friend good to talk to you thanks everybody for listening and subscribing and uh, we'll see you all at the next one <laughs>